Jesus. <clears throat> um, it's a wonderful blessing to study this wonderful book. We're in our, in our ninth chapter. And as you know, we realize that it's very difficult to speak about the different kind of gems that this book has for us in a few minutes. I thank God that during our Bible studies, we can expand more on this, these verses, and uh, so we'll have more time to do that. However, um, as we are going uh, through the chapters, um, we are realizing now that chapter 9 has a great significance. Um, for us today, we have seen that it seems at first glance that chapter 9, 10, 11 um, stand alone in the, in the book of Romans. However, it is not so because the thought, the idea of the righteous will live by faith and the, ju just, just, the just lives by his faithfulness and runs through the whole book. Um, last week, we discussed how Paul felt when he looked around him and saw his own people um, lost, and uh, how he wished himself to be um, uh, lost himself for the sake of uh, winning the others, his brethren, his the Jewish people. And um, this morning, um, um, we're going to discuss a little bit about something which is this, um, a major subject um, of the book, speci specifically um, in chapter 9, and this is the sovereignty of God. We know, even by our own experience, when we discuss the subject in Bible study, how one can approach the sov sovereignty of God in so many different ways, basically in two major doctrines. And uh, the on one hand, there would be people saying that God is so sovereign that whatever he decides um, will happen, um, and he actually have decided before the creation of the world who is going to be born and go to heaven and those who are going to be born and go to hell. And that would be his own choice. And the other side is that, no, we have a choice um, we have been uh, given the uh, uh, we've been given we've been given um, uh, the right to choose, and so one can be saved, whatever, as long as he believes in Jesus. And both extremes are wrong. There are two two propositions in this chapter, and we need to see it, see it, see it or see them this way, because. In the Bible, a principle is a doctrine. It can never be taken to an extreme. It has to be seen in the context, its immediate context, and also in the whole Bible. But for sure, and no one will challenge this, that God is absolute, absolutely sovereign. There's no doubt that God is God. He can decide and things happen. He doesn't depend on molecules or on atoms. He says, I want to create a universe, and he creates it. And that's God. However, his sovereignty 
never functions in Scripture to reduce human responsibility. And that's where disagreement starts. There are some people that say um, um, we are not responsible um, because God decided beforehand how we are going to act as we act. And this is a problem. It is a problem because when God created us, he created us in his own image, in his own likeness. And therefore, we are persons. And because we are persons, we are responsible because God is responsible. And that is why in his sovereignty, God gave us his creation, the ability to choose, for example, to believe, to respond, and to make moral or immoral choices. These thoughts we find in this chapter are very important because we cannot in any way challenge God and say, God, you created me a sinner, so if I sin, it's not my problem. You created me that way. And on the other hand, we can say, now, how on earth do I know if I'm saved or I'm not saved? Yet, because the Bible says several times, and we'll see this now in the next chapter, whosoever believes shall be saved. And the tenses in the Greek are very important because when we read, for example, um, um, certain verbs, we need to see them in the, their actual verb tense in the Greek. And when we are destined for wrath, we should read it, for example, because it is in the middle voice, we destined ourselves for destruction. And we destined ourselves for destruction is in the middle voice, not in the aorist tense, which then it will say, I have been made to lose my soul. But that's not the case. God gave us the will to make a decision and make a decision to believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. God gave us the ability to decide whether or not we want to follow him and follow in his footsteps. This chapter is challenging in several ways, and it is difficult to um, express all the important points of it um, in our short time. However, we immediately notice as we read this passage, as this chapter, that there are several Old Testament quotations. I've told you some time ago that there are 70, approximately 70 quotes in uh, Romans from the Old Testament. I say approximately because some are direct quotes, some are references, and there are, you know, a couple that are not sure. So I say approximately. And when I say approximately, um, I'm saying that this chapter, this book of 16 chapters, have 70 such references. Now, this chapter 9, this chapter 9 has 14 direct references from the Old Testament. Chapter 10, which is part of this group of chapters, 9, 10, and 11, has 12 direct um, Old Testament quotations. Chapter 11 has nine direct quotations from the Old Testament. Together, and I did the calculator with this, there are 35, sorry, 35 quotations from the Old Testament in these three scriptures. And we ask why? We, and the answer would be God wants us, wanted the Jews of those times, hearing this book being read, to realize that they are still part in God's plan for the world, for him and his salvation. The, the, the book, the, the, this, this chapter is asking questions like, then what happens to us? Did God let go of Israel? And Paul says, certainly not. 
And then he gives us the reasons why the plan of God is still going on even during the disobedience of the Jews. Yet his promise to Abraham, his promise to Isaac, his promise to Jacob will remain forever. Whatever happens with our decisions, it's not going to change God's plans. The reason is that even the wicked is created so that God's plans will go on. The question would be, why is Pharaoh responsible for his decisions with Moses if it was God that hardened his heart? Who can do anything against God if God hardens your heart? And I have bad news. If God hardens your heart, you can do nothing about it. But we cannot start from the tail. We need to look at the head. And if we go into the book of Exodus, where we find this story, we will find that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And we find this several times. Pharaoh hardened his times, but his heart. But then we'll find God hardened his heart. And this helps us to realize, hey, I can know God's word. I can hear God's preaching. I can see God's signs. And although I see all these things, I still want to live my life as I want to live it. And that's where we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful, even as the church, because although we have the word of God, we hear it being preached, we read it if we read the Bible, and yet we still can say, I want to have my own Christianity. I don't agree with this, but I agree with the other, and this cannot happen. In God's point of view, this is a direct violation of to his holiness, to his righteousness. God wants us to be obedient in every way, especially after we realize the love of God. We realize that God has a plan for us. As we have seen before during this book and other references that we had, God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life and will not come into condemnation. Praise God. But there is an action from our side, and this it is believing in who God is. God is God. God is sovereign, and God made his plans, and God will not change his plans because we do not agree with him. One other reason that we need to see here is that when we see God's power, when we see God's love, when we see God moving in our midst, we must not forget our experience with God. We have it written, and God's word is alive. It affects our life. That is why we build our life on the word of God. Let's go to the Jews who just have seen the um, uh, conflict between the gods of Pharaoh and witchcraft and the power of the Holy God. And we see that the um, Jews has gone um, out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, a mighty miracle of its own, go on the other side, and they start complaining about food and so on. And you know what? The, the, the next thing what they do is they create a god of gold for themselves. They forgot about the holiness and presence of God and made another god for themselves. And this sometimes happened to us, although we may not be able to make gods of gold, because some of us don't have gold, but still we made gold, we, sorry, we made idols for ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why the Jews were cut off for a period of time, because they have disbelieved who God is. 
they thought they can do the works without the faith. That's what we find it at the bottom of the chapter. And sometimes we believers do the same thing. We forgot, forget about God's mercy. We forget about God's justice. And we forget about God's love and about Jesus' sacrifice. And we decide to do whatever we want to do. However, being in the body of Christ is not like that. If we believe that God exists, and I believe Christians believe that God exists, I hope so, then we have also to understand and accept the fact that he is the potter and we are simply clay. What God wants to do with our life, it's up to him. And that is why we, the clay, cannot say to the potter, listen, I don't want to be the handle, I want to be the spout. Who are you to tell the potter, I don't want to be a handle and I want to be a spout? The potter decides what he wants to do with the clay, and so does God. And that is why I say again, and I keep on repeating it, that it is important to realize that there is a divine, eternal plan for your life for my life. And as long as we are in that plan, nothing can come against you and break you, not even death. And I am a living experience of that. If God has a plan for you and you have three heart attacks and you simply are passing through the other side, you have an experience with God and sends you back to continue what he has asked you to do. And this goes on for everybody. You don't have to have any heart attacks or strokes and so forth. You don't need those things for God to establish you in your calling. All you need to do is being obedient to the calling of God. Find out what the, your plan, God's plan for your life is. It's very important if we are going to understand the nature of God. The potter is not answerable to the clay. God doesn't have to say why he wants this out of us. When Paul was called and he had to fall off a, the, the back of a horse, I guess he used to know. I, 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 understand, I assume he knew how to ride horses, don't you? Huh? But because of what happened, the way he met with God, God wanted to bring this Paul, this great man, and use that knowledge and his zeal, instead of a kicking at the ghost against Christ, he serves Christ. But so, he gave his life to Jesus, he followed him, and yet we see him suffering for the sake of the gospel. He doesn't care. That he doesn't have any planes and boats and ships, you know, and yachts. He doesn't care about that. What he cared was that he's serving Jesus. Now, some preachers today, you say, unless you have a plane or a helicopter or something, you're not in the grace of God. But that's the modern forced preachers that teach that. The biblical preacher will say, if you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you are to suffer for Jesus. That's what Paul said himself. Those who follow Jesus will suffer persecution. And that persecution that Paul had has nothing to do with the persecution where the Christians will suffer at the end of the age. And that's why it's important that we are part of God's plan, how he designed our life. So when that trouble comes, unless the rapture comes before, we'll be able to stand firm to be built on that rock, to be built on the word of God, according to his will, so that when the wind and the rain of persecution blow on us, we will stand firm. I want to bring something to your attention before I close. If you heard the news yesterday, we heard about this Maltese Catholic group that's been um, excommunicated from the Roman church. We heard that, right? And they're going to be sued for preaching or where we might not agree with what they are doing, but 
the main thing that was amplified on the news is the issue of homosexuality. Imagine what they will be able to do to us, evangelicals, pastors, or whoever, who stand on the word of God and say, we believe what the Bible says. Are we going to stand firm or do like the Maltese bishop and turn around and accept everything like the Pope did? What are we going to do? What are we going to say when we are being persecuted because we stand firm on the word of God? And I tell you, as long as you are grafted in the vine, as long as you are one with Jesus, nothing and no one will drive you away. Jesus will take care of you. Jesus is not going to let go of you during the time of persecution. In fact, he will use you, he will use that persecution so that he will glorify, he will show his power in your faith in Jesus against that persecution. And we have a chance, there is a big chance that we will be able to show our obedience to God if this persecution comes on us next week, tomorrow and so on. We know things are moving fast. You know that many, many years ago, I used to mention Brexit, although I didn't use the word Brexit because I didn't know it exists. Probably it didn't. But I did tell you, part of the end times will be when England come out of the EU, because it was never part of the old Roman Empire. Yesterday, I had a visit from someone who attended for a short time to this church and he said, I came here because I wanted to tell you, he came to my home, that what you've been saying to us years ago, I've seen it happening now. And I said, thank you, Jesus. So I hope the people of the church that come Sunday after Sunday realize what I'm talking about. Because you heard it years ago and you still remember it. And that is a sign of the end times. I've told you a few weeks ago, Nobody says that Israel is negotiating a peace treaty with Sudan. Of all places, Sudan. The peace treaty took place. The understanding of a peace treaty took place. Did you hear that on the news? Did you hear that on the news? You won't hear those things on the news. It's part of what God is doing. And you don't hear this on the news because the news is working. The news outlets are working for the spirit of the Antichrist. And that spirit's been here, and it's working stronger and stronger now. So, brothers and sisters, to, to, to close this, God showed his power in different situations, like in the situation of Moses, in the situation of Pharaoh. Paul made it very clear from the very first verse of this chapter that he is called, and I told you that the verb there means he is called out for a mission. He was called by choice to be an apostle, and you are called for whatever you are called to be, but make sure that you are in that calling. And if you say, I'm fed up of hearing this, I say, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it unless I see the last member of this church walking in the calling that God has given him or her. That's my duty as the pastor. So, brothers and sisters, I challenge you this morning. Look at God as a sovereign God, a powerful God. Not a God that is like a Christmas father that you go to him when you need something. He's not a God up there that he doesn't care about what's going on down here. Look at God as the one that has all power over all things. And whatever is happening in your life is designed so that you can give him that glory. The next problem that comes to you or the problem that's visiting you right now, take it as an opportunity to give glory and to show your faith, your obedience to Jesus Christ. That's in his sovereignty. In his sovereignty, he allowed that to happen so that through that trial, 
guess what? You rejoice in Jesus. In that trial, you will be strong. In that trial, you will show that your faith will not shake because you are rooted in the Son of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father, we praise you. Father, we thank you. Father, we glorify you. Father, we declare your sovereignty over our life. Thank you, Lord, that you trust us, that we can take the right decisions and follow you the rest of our life. With all of all our ups and with all of our downs, we know that you are with us and that you will never leave us and you, that you will never forget us. I pray, oh God, that we, if we are disobedient to you, you help us to give us the strength to repent and to start our walk again with you. Father, in Jesus' name, whatever we do in our life, let it always end up by you having glory and praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.